May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight. The Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. I mean, the contrast in proclaiming the call to repentance in Ash Wednesday and the call to proclaim the resurrection of Jesus at Easter could not be more stark. I have to tell you, I feel incredibly confident and full of joy on Easter Sunday. I look forward to it. Uh, the most evangelistic Sunday in the entire church year. An extraordinary opportunity to introduce to people and remind Christians of this extraordinary power of God and what has been won for us on Christ's behalf. That's, that's home base for me. Here, it feels very, very, very different. I feel like I'm bumbling and I don't quite know how to get at it. And the reason is, is because in Easter, I proclaim something that comes from a place of deep confidence. My heart has been changed by the resurrected power of Christ. This is different. Repentance is something that one never quite grasps. If it's easy, I don't think you know what you're talking about. Because who can plummet the depths of the human heart? Every time I think I have a sense of balance about all of these things, to quote Joel, God blows the trumpet <laughs> and reveals something about myself that I, that I didn't want to face, quite honestly. And in so doing, I'm thrown back again into a place of, oh my gosh, how do I even begin to talk about that? Because you see, repentance is a gift. God has to break through and show us the things about ourselves that we're not willing to see. And not merely to see them, but to see them rightly. So that we neither fall into the despair of condemnation from which there appears to be no aid. But nor do we see them at a distance so that we, in a way that really is quite facile, oh, they're covered by the blood of Jesus and I'm okay. You see, neither of those speaks of the Spirit of Christ. The first one is condemnation from which we are freed. The second is denial. And both are extraordinarily dangerous. And yet, the temptation to both of those is extraordinary. Um, I have this fear that if I really were to plumb at the depths of all that is inside of me, would I come out the same person? I don't know, you see. I'm keenly aware that there are locked doors that the Holy Spirit has yet to open. And I'm not sure I know what's in it. And so it would be very easy for me to speak in a way that um, is way too facile about the call to repentance. As if it is one of those perfunctory things that we do. Because after all, we're forgiven, aren't we? And it would not be true either to the scriptures or to the need of, in us, for God to come again, as he always promises to do, to create in us that clean heart, as it says in the 51st Psalm, so that we are not the, as the Corinthian Christians who were warned not to receive the grace of God in vain. That is, you see, quite possible. Otherwise, why would the scriptures through speak such a word to believing Christians in Corinth? And I'm not talking about the loss of salvation so much as that I'm talking about the living of a kind of superficial life 
that never knows either the depth of forgiveness or the height of God's power in us who believe, so that we instead live insipid lives. You see, I think for Christians, that's the danger. It's a life where there's no power, that's impotent, that's insipid. And we have this kind of facile, well, I know I'm going to heaven. <coughs> and therefore, we're not effective either in our own intimacy with Jesus or in the wonder of God using us to make a difference in the lives of other people. You see, that's why Paul takes us where he does in that sixth chapter today, where the appeal is not to receive the grace of God in vain. And then where Paul goes with that is that he begins to talk about the character and the witness of what he lives as an apostle. He said, we put no obstacle in anyone's way. He gives this whole list, servants of God, commending ourselves, afflictions and endurance and hardship, calamities, beatings, imprisonment, riots, labor, sleepless nights, hunger, because it's a life that is deeply given in gratitude mm -hmm. to God and for his service, which is actually where repentance takes you. Repentance is not meant to take you to a place of self-satisfaction. Repentance is meant to take you to a place of sacrificial service. And if that's not the fruit, I'm not sure it's repentance. It's just a sad. And that's why Paul takes us where he does. That, it seems to me, that fruit of sacrifice is the outworking of what for me is the most powerful word in all of Paul's epistles. He made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What is that? If it is not learning by God's power and mercy, to lay down your life. And it is to that that we're invited. And it is because of that that repentance becomes worthwhile. <laughs> not to feel better. Not in the assuaging of guilt, although it certainly does give us that but in the experience of God's power that calls us in new ways to the kind of heartbreaking compassion that gives one's life away for the sake of the gospel. And that's why we repent, because we, don't, we want self-preservation. We don't want self-sacrifice. We have this, there's this wonderful little line in Basil when he's talking about repentance. And he talks about our sliding thoughts, entropy, taking us back into the place of just modicum, status. And more often than not, that's our experience. We need God to break through, to give us the gift of repentance. And that what might come out of it is this kind of compassionate generosity. So please, on this Ash Wednesday, and as we enter into Lent together, my goal, and I certainly hope it's yours, is not merely the assuaging of guilt, the facing of our fears, and the healing of our hearts, though all of those are important, but that instead God would take us both in those and through those into a place of self-sacrifice, which I believe is in fact, true fruit of 